The Locked On Podcast Network presents the NBA Big 3 in 30. The three biggest stories in the NBA from our local experts at the Locked On Podcast Network. We bring you the real story, why it matters, what's next, who wins the big game, and more, all in 30 minutes. The NBA Big 3 and 30 starts now with the biggest story in the NBA. You are Locked On Warriors, your daily Golden State Warriors podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Man, (laughs) I'm stunned. I'm stunned how the Warriors were able to get this one done. Incredible defense from Andrew Wiggins on Luka Doncic. We saw it on the last possession. It flipped the game at times. But when it all came down to it, it was Steph Curry scoring the final 12 points and putting on a vintage performance in front of a ruckus crowd. We're only supposed to have three topics on the show. We're supposed to go bam, bam, bam. There's a million topics to get to. Come on. Let's start us off with how the Warriors were able to claw back in this game. Down by seven with about four minutes left. D'Anthony Melton starts it off with a three. Then Curry goes on his flurry and the Dubs never look back. Down nine when Melton hit that three and it was and nine. Wow. Th- I, I believe I think it was yeah, 114, 105, I think was the score at that point, and made it 108. It it's uh, this was an awesome game, first of all. Uh, start Unreal. to finish, both teams were uh, you know, I I don't love throwing I'm sorry, you're right, it was seven, it was one twelve, one oh five. I don't love throwing around playoff intensity, but I don't know how else you describe what was going on at Chase Center tonight. Everybody came to play. Uh, You know, I'm not saying everyone played great, but there was no point in this game where it felt like either team took their foot off the gas pedal. There were incredible runs by both teams, incredible shot making, incredible defense, particularly by the Warriors. But the Mavs defense is nothing to sneeze at either. What a game of basketball. Uh, the the Emirates NBA Cup is delivering. It has started off on the right note. And I talked a lot about Andrew Wiggins and his defense, but I'm really burying the lead here because Draymond Green, this is how Draymond Green looked in today's game. He's possessed. Shackle him down. Dude, that was wow. vintage. That was incredible defense from Draymond Green. To anyone who says Draymond Green can't affect the basketball game, I don't know if there's many people out there, but I've heard it before. Did you just watch that? Proof's I've, in the pudding. Uh, no kidding. And, and by the way, another 50% night from three point range. You know, nothing to sneeze at in that category either. The, the guy. For two years, you know, for last year plus 11, 12 games, whatever we're at, he's knocking down threes at an elite level. Not not just decent. You'd take 35, 36% from Draymond. He's he's over 40 for the last year plus, which is huge for this team. Just huge. I thought Kaminga was spectacular tonight. You know, Wiggins drew most of the big defensive assignments, but when Kaminga was asked to deal with Luca or Clay, I thought he was on his game defensively, and then he hit some big shots as well. And, and look, when Steph is not in there, especially when Wiggins has a defensive assignment like he did tonight, I, Kaminga's really the guy they can go to to take it to the rack and get one-on-one buckets. You know, they don't have anybody else to do that, and he did that. In key situations tonight, uh, Moses Moody came in and played some key defense, made one big cut for a dunk that that was important in this game. It just, it was great top to bottom. And I'll tell you what else. There was talk during this game about that 12-man rotation, right? Is that sustainable? How long can it go for? And Reggie Miller outright said, no, it's not sustainable. And we're going to get into who the odd man out could be. And it's one of my favorite players on this team. If the Anthony Melton continues to play the way he does and stays healthy, but the, the health factor, another reason why it's nice to have the depth, but that's the conversation for down the road. I want to start well, Hold on quickly before I, I, not about that, but just about the, the 12 man rotation. If this is playoff intensity, I think you just saw how the 12 man rotation can still work against a good basketball team in an intense environment. There. You just give a few guys seven and 12 minutes and, and sprinkle the rest 
give Curry 35, Wiggins 34, Green 32. I mean, it felt from, from the start, man. I mean, what, three hours, two hours before the game, we see the videos going viral on social media of the, the 400 employees welcoming Clay Thompson. With the captain hat, in it. I mean, that's an you know he was loving that. He was loving the entire night. After his tribute video, he went out there. He was clapping for him. He, I deserve this. I deserve. He it. does. I he did. does. And yeah. dude, uh, everybody did tonight right. You know what I mean? Uh, it was right down. Yeah, electric. right down to the Warriors win. The fans were beautiful. Clay handled it beautifully. The fact that the you know damn near every employee of the organization lined up in captain's hats for the guy. It's a beautiful thing. Look, winning four titles for a franchise as a key player is a remarkable accomplishment that very few people have and very few people will in the entire past and future of the NBA accomplish. He deserves everything he gets in that building and for it to come in a a win where Stefan Draymond simply said, we love you, but no. <laughs> like that, there's, you know, if you're a Warriors fan, I don't think there's, it's a no notes sort of a night, right? <laughs> five out of five, no notes. So this one's from CTB channel on the chat. Found myself still rooting from Clay. Yeah, from time to time, and that's how it was. He hit his first three point of the game, and the crowd erupted. I mean, it was he a, had a good game. He did what six threes, the final number for him. Yep. So Clay had six, missed the big one with like a minute fifteen to go. Uh, Mavericks down one. It could have really helped him out there. But how about the first possession of the game, right off the opening tip? <laughs> it's Clay. It's Steph going after each other. Uh, Steph fouls him. Then a possession or two later, Steph just completely picked his pocket. I mean. Steph obviously got the better of Clay in the game. They only had the matchups on each other every once in a while. But with this remarkable a period in NBA history that those two had together, I mean, four NBA championships, it's up there with the greatest dynasties in the history of the sport. When you have that coffee, the coffee table book of the NBA 150 anniversary, you know, when we're living on Mars or whatever it is years down the road, you're going to be pulling out that thing and that picture is going to be in there. Steph and Clay, you know, trying to block each other's shots, pick each other's pockets. It was weird. It was weird to see. It's it, it was weird. And I don't think it's going to be much less weird next time. You know, these teams will see each other a few times this year. A playoff matchup is not out of the question. You know, it's it's always going to be weird to see Clay Thompson in another uniform, just like if God forbid either Steph or Draymond ends up in another uniform at some point, like no matter what Clay does the rest of his career, he's a forever warriors to quote Monte Ellis. He is, he, he I think if you're a warriors fan, hopefully he defined certainly a period of this franchise along with those two other guys, but also Hopefully, Clay Thompson is a part of establishing what this franchise will be forever now, which is one of the consistently competitive, frequently elite franchises in the NBA. That was not the Golden State Warriors story before this dynasty. And again, like, it's always going to be weird, but. Tonight went about as well as it could go for a warrior slash clay fan to see him looking good, feeling happy, doing his thing. And the warriors get the W because ultimately Steph is the guy and he was the guy all night tonight, but especially when it counted the most. I want to get into the box score a little bit, specifically Steph Curry and specifically the final flurry that he had. I mean, let's just tease it with this. Have you ever seen Steph Curry show that kind of emotion when he ran up to the camera by the uh by the boards at the end and just i don't even want to reenact it i'll, I'll break the microphone with how loud he was screaming i mean that's we, we've there. seen we've seen passionate steph but that was man he wanted that one bad it's hard it's hard to think of 
times when he was significantly more passionate. You know, I can think of a few mouth guard tosses and uh, he wanted to toss it though. He, he was he couldn't. Find he did. It. He did. He was trying to pull out the mouth guard. I thought he was going to throw it, but but yeah, he couldn't quite couldn't quite get purchase on the mouth guard. I know that. You know, every morning when I wake up and try to take out my like nighttime retainer, I have the same struggles. Anyway, <laughs> me and Steph, very, he's a very relatable guy. Uh, I. I don't know that I've ever seen him that fired up like out of the pure joy and, and winningness, right? Uh, certainly not in a regular season game that I, I can't remember a regular season celebration like that, nor can I remember as reckless a night night. Like he usually saves the night night for the four next point one. game, four point game, 26 seconds left. Steph yeah. Curry throws out the night night. It was in danger. He's I, an unbeaten we, streak, right? Yeah. Well, we saw how dangerous that was when Quentin Grimes of all people nailed a three on the next position. Like that could have gone yeah. very squirrely, but uh, yeah, that tells you how fired up he was and how into this he was. And, and like we said yesterday at no point, did anyone ever believe this was just another regular season game? Get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now new customers can bet $5 and get $150 in bonus bets if you win. The FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL all in one place. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. Just visit FanDuel.com to join today. You'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. And that winning $5 bet could be on some Wednesday night basketball. How about that? The enigmatic Indiana Pacers head south to face the Orlando Magic. FanDuel actually has the Magic as two and a half point underdogs in this one, despite having beaten the Pacers in Orlando once this season. That's FanDuel.com. Never waste a hunch and make every moment more with FanDuel an official sports book partner of the NFL. The big fella did make his return, but it wasn't as dynamic as maybe some people would hope. You are locked on 76ers, your daily Philadelphia 76ers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Joel Embiid, 13 points, three rebounds, five assists. I'm going to start off by... I have said throughout every single episode, the last game that I want him to come back is against somebody like Carl Anthony Towns. And I know, I know Kat wasn't really good in the paint coming into this game on the defensive side of the ball, but Embiid really struggled. And it wasn't just against Kat. His conditioning wasn't there. But to me, Keith, this is what I expected. My hopes were that he had 25 to 30 points. What I expected is usually what happens when he comes off of injury is his conditioning's not there and it takes him a few games to get back. Were you expecting worse? Were you expecting better? Did it meet your expectations? How do you kind of overall look at this, Keith, in Joel and these performance when he's back? You know, I, I guess it's, it's tough to say. I mean, you know, well, he didn't look good. Let's just put it that way. Um, you know, in regards to it, was I expecting it? I mean, with all the hype and all the buildup, I mean, this guy has been practicing for, what, two weeks? Mm -hmm. um, I know he, he couldn't be with the team in the three games he was suspended, but the days that the team practiced in L.A., he was out there with them. You know, he practiced uh, a couple of days ago. They said he was doing five on five. I was expecting a better performance. Um, I mean, we look at it, we say 13 points, but he was actually two for 11 shooting. Um he missed his first five shots from three. He was one for five. Um, you know, he looked rusty, which you expected. He he looked a little um, out of basketball shape. I mean, he was gassed after five minutes. And then the one thing is he looked timid at times. And so, you know, I didn't expect Carl Anthony Towns to dominate him. And that's what he did. He dominated Embiid, if you really want to be honest with it. So, no, I did not expect that. I thought that MB would probably come out here and try to impo impose his will on national TV against him. And then it raises a lot of concerns, right? Is it just because he hasn't played with this team? Is that knee really bothering him? Now he is playing with that brace. So it's a little awkward probably getting used to that. But he's also played 
with having a brace on that knee before. So there's a lot of questions that kind of arise here. And I looked at it immediately and said, we've seen this with Joel before where he'll try to match the intensity of a big. For example, we've seen it with Joel Embiid and Al Horford. We're looking way back at this point where Al Horford will drain a three in his face and then Joel tries to do the same thing. You're saying, okay, well, why isn't Joel just playing his game? We didn't really see that match in intensity this time around. Cat was going out there, doing a little bit of everything defensively and offensively. He really set the tone for New York coming into this game. And Joel Embiid looks like he hasn't played basketball since the summer, and he really hasn't been. But what we've been hearing, Keith, is he's been dominating in practice. He's going throughout these scrimmages. He's looking really good. To me, I understand that there's a difference between practice and game, and this is kind of where I figured Joel would look, but this looks like somebody that really hasn't been dominating in practice. Maybe Andre Drum is not giving him enough run for his money. I don't really know, but he looked absolutely gassed out there, and this worries me if he's not going to continue to play those back-to-backs because – where is that conditioning going to lie when all of a sudden he's in one game and out the next? Yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, there was one time when he was knocked to the ground, he fell to the ground, like he was down there like, hmm, like on his back. You know, and um, the, the thing about it is, you're right, um, there's two things. It, one thing, you can't always believe what you hear, right? People are always yeah. going to say they dominate, they do this and that. But I also think that, you know, practice is different from the game because you can stop it. It's like controlled. You just don't keep running up and down the right. floor. But also, I think a lot of the problem is with Joel is, and he said it, is like mental. He has to get over the mental thing. There was times in the past where Joel would just power his way to the basket or he would do a move. He would do this and that. He just seemed a little too timid, like he didn't want to exert himself for fear that he would get hurt. Right. And then when you when you compound that with, you know what, I'm not quite in basketball shape left yet. It looks bad at certain at at certain times in the game. And that's exactly what happened. But like the one thing you said, you know, we're talking about, you know, what he had three rebounds. I mean, I know he played 26 minutes and 25 seconds, but, you know, Joel was the biggest guy out there on the floor and you were expecting him to get the rebounds. You were also expecting him to dominate in the paint and he wasn't doing it. Now there was a couple of times I felt like they needed to get the ball a little quicker to him and they didn't. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, I feel like his playing timid or for fear that he would probably re injure the knee kind of had a negative impact on his performance. And it's interesting because you look at it and you say, Joel is clearly, it's not only even the injury because Joel has been injured before, but, I think Embiid knows at this point of his career that the time to win is right now. It's not in three years. It's not in five years. It's not getting other stars on this team. You got Paul George and you got Tyrese Maxey, and this could be the year. Right now, it's not super promising, right? But this could be a situation where you help bring this team past the second round of the playoffs because that's really what they're looking at right now. Of course, NBA Finals is the goal, but you're looking to get out of the second round realistically. So Joel knows that at any point, If he comes down awkwardly, if he lands a way that he doesn't want to, if he falls on a certain way, that that could be the end not only to his season, but also to the 76ers' hopes. So there's a lot of pressure on his shoulders. Now, is this something we're going to continue to see throughout really the first half of this season? Do you think he's going to get a little bit more used to it? Because playing with a brace is uncomfortable as it is, but I want to see Joel go out there and dominate because if he's in his head, Keith, I think that almost can cause a little bit more injury if you're second guessing how you're going to come down or how you're going to go up and then everything just kind of falls out of place. I mean, it could be something that continues, Um, you know, like let's let's face it. uh, It could like if they're saying he never had a setback, if they're saying that and if that's 100 percent true, then it's something that he's been dealing with since he came back since the Olympics. Right. So. You know, mental thing can can impact you negatively. Now, again, he's saying it could it could change the next game. It could change in two games. He says he believes that he's going to get over the hump. But yeah, it could have a a negative impact on someone. It's kind of like, you know, and it's it's not that caliber. But you know, sometimes you see people, and all of a sudden they have a hitch in their shot, and it's because of the mental. 
Like they just don't do the things they did before. I think that for Joel Embiid, it's, it's easy for us to say, just go out there and play. Don't worry about getting injured. But when you rush back and you came back too soon, you know, that's always going to be in the back of your mind. So, you know, hopefully for the Sixers, if I'm numb, yeah, this is something that I want to, you know, address and get over. Yeah, and I think that's conversations that he'll have to have with Nick Nurse, even Paul George, the superstars of this team, Tyrese Maxey, because when you look at this situation, it is the injury on top of where you want this team to be, what you know you can lead this team to be. Not only that, seeing this team without Joel Embiid year after year, but especially the beginning of the season, I mean, they are not going to win anything if they don't have Joel Embiid and the supporting cast of Paul George and Tyrese Maxey. So there's a lot of pressure on his shoulders right now. Now, granted, he is the franchise player. This is what everybody is amping him up to be. But trying to get over that mental factor, I think, is easier said than done. We see it a lot of times. When you look at the NFL even, right, we say that, well, these players aren't playing preseason games and we expect them week one to go out there and be perfect. And it's kind of messy and all over the place because they don't get that real game speed. Or when they have an ACL tear, it takes a little bit longer to come back physically and mentally. Now, Joel Embiid kind of going through a similar thing right now. So we're going to have to wait and see. Overall, I think this is a performance, hopefully, Keith, that we can look back on and say, well, we don't really remember that because it was his first game back. Because he just didn't look like himself last night. He was very timid, as you alluded to. Very rusty, very tired, exhausted. And this is something I hope that we can look past going forward because we're going to talk on it in a moment. But his co-star and Paul George is definitely putting up some points up there that Joel Embiid's going to try to match. Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets for your favorite live events even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. Curation makes it easier to save more on sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and more near you. You can take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code locked on for $20 off. Download game time today. What time is it? Game time. Injury updates for the Lakers. Some good, some not good. You are locked on Lakers, your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast. Well, it's the most important. Anthony Davis can see he's going to play. Um, he, his eye is, uh, apparently okay. And he is not going to wear goggles, but he is going to play against Memphis. And if I have to choose one of those things play, you know, okay, but mm. you know, but still put on some goggles as, as the memes tell us all the time, why not both? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's funny. I, when AD had to leave the game on Sunday, uh, because he got poked in the eye. I had tweeted out at Cam Brothers, I'm going to go to change.org and start a petition from all concerned Lakers citizens demanding that Anthony Davis wear goggles. And yep. I said this half serious, half kidding, the kidding part mostly being, I don't know if I'm actually going to put in the work to create a petition. But then after seeing this news, I'm like, I'm really going to have to write this effing petition, aren't I? I'm going to actually have to do this. Well, um, he, the man just doesn't want to wear goggles, Andy. And um, we're all now just going to have to hold our breath and wait for the next time he gets poked in the face, which seems to happen to Anthony Davis. I don't know, a couple times a week now. I mean, I hope at this point that he ha that when he eventually has to wear goggles, because the doctors say, no, this is the only way we're going to clear you. He gets stuck wearing the dumbest looking goggles possible because he had an opportunity to go find some cool ones, make a fashion statement, get a fat endorsement from Louis Vuitton or whoever he ends up getting their goggles. I hope he ends up with the nerdiest, like, tape across the middle of the bridge that i i hope ad looks like really kurt stupid. rambus goggles except yeah, not but, glasses but, just goggles right dumber like yeah dumber like they turned kurt rambus into a, a pre-front office icon i i hope that these turn ad into a still performing at a high elite level laughing stock <laughs> <laughs> an aesthetic laughing stock yeah um 
Well, the good news, though, at least, is he is going to play. Everyone keep your fingers away from Anthony Davis's face. Uh, he is going to play, and given the injury problems that the Grizzlies have, no John Morant, no Desmond Bain, uh, Marcus Smart still out for them. Like He this- did practice. Uh, DeMichael Cole over at Locked On Grizzlies actually tweeted out because he also covers the team for the Memphis Commercial Appeal. He apparently practiced Wednesday, the degree to which I don't Desmond know. Bain? No, no, Marcus Smart. Marcus Smart, yeah. But so, I think he's still out for for, for this game. And, and, and But is is he's been listed as doubtful for the last couple of games, which, to be fair, is an improvement over right. uh, others. But he, I believe the way he phrased it was inching towards a return and did practice. Again, it was just a tweet, so there were not a ton of details in there. I'm just letting people know it wouldn't stun me if Marcus Smart was available. But uh, Bain and, and Morant are both out. And so this means the the Grizzlies, who, as always, play hard and play smart and do all that stuff, are certainly very vulnerable. Um, and the Lakers ought to win this one. By the way, this is not an NBA Cup game. So the, the title defense actually begins on Friday. Yes. Um, but in San uh, you may see a lot, a lot around the league. The the Cup has, has started. Um and uh, but not for the Lakers until Friday. So it's just a regular game. <laughs> I I'm very pleased that Davis is back and this is a game that the Lakers absolutely need to make sure that they win. Uh the odds of that not happening um are significantly lower if Anthony Davis is on the floor. Um some bad news though for the Lakers on the injury front. Christian Wood it was reported on Tuesday will uh, be shut down for a little bit. He is not reacting well to his ramp up uh, and they're going to ramp him back down. The knee that the surgically repaired knee is experiencing a little swelling. They can't just kind of can't get him comfortable and can't get him right. They're not even going to bother looking at the guy for another month. And so effectively Christian Wood is out until mid December, uh, I think at the very least and likely until after the first of the year, um, still no news on Jared Vanderbilt, which means he, <laughs> but at least it's not crappy. Right. <laughs> the last time we got an update on one of those two, we didn't like it. So. As I tweeted out, no news is uh, not always good news, but sometimes news isn't good news either. Um, it just, it, it, you and it I had a feeling, you and I had a feeling that with Christian Wood, I mean, with Vando, it's been so freaking vague anyway. Like the whole surgery thing was a surprise. Like there's a certain amount that I think we just have to accept they're not telling us. But with Christian Wood, this was around the timeline where we were supposed to be getting an update. And the fact that it required asking with the update struck both of us as not a great sign. It was, it's, it's that, and it's a couple things. It's what, what, and we talked about this, I believe on uh, Monday's show or Tuesday's show is Normally, there are reports of, and Christian Wood was out on the floor doing mm-hmm. side work, and like, and there's no official update, but he's like out there, and like, and, and the update is he's progressing toward like, but there's been nothing, and so, um, it it is one of those deals where I think you just have to uh, officially say that for the foreseeable future, the team that they have now is the team that they are going to have, and that may be probably until. Was it December 15th when you can start making uh, trades with guys uh, who've had transactions and stuff over the summer? I think really realistically, the earliest that you're going to see any new players on this team, including the guys who are actually on the roster, like new new to the lineup, would be uh, following that deadline. By the way, I'm not uh, expecting that to happen anytime either. I will say this. There are a lot of people... Uh, I've seen expressing frustration and saying that something must be wrong with the Lakers medical staff um, for this wood setback. And I, I would hesitate to start casting blame uh, on the, on the training staff, on his doctors, on his therapists, whatever. We, we just don't know what's going on. And like, and wood is coming back from multiple surgeries Vanderbilt is coming back from multiple surgeries. The human body is enormously complex. It is a difficult thing to recover from these things. And remember, these guys aren't 
they're not recovering to try to go do workouts like you and I might go to the gym and whatever, or, you know, these, they're trying to get back to playing NBA basketball and the demands for that are way beyond anything that normal people have to do. And so this is a frustrating part of the process. I don't know if it's anybody's fault necessarily. Um, and I, I think probably, and you may agree, we can talk about it now or after the break or both. Some of it is just, I guess, frustration at the messaging, maybe, or the lack of information, uh, or no, I don't also, too, that these guys you. just never get back on the floor. I don't entirely agree with you, to be honest. 